starting a new sermon series today that goes through Galatians. And our first topic is the true gospel. And this next song is about the true gospel of Christ. Let's sing this one together. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope. 
without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a crane death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood Father, that you sent your son for us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've come and filled us up with your fire to go out and preach the gospel in your name. God, I pray that we don't forget the true meaning of the gospel. The reason why you came is to go out and spread the news, to bring it and build your kingdom here, Lord. God, I pray that we could have humble hearts and open minds today as we hear what Mike has to say, and that we could truly take a look at ourselves and see what needs to be changed, where our hearts need to to grow more towards you, Lord, so that we could be dedicated to spreading the news of the gospel. Lord, we love you. It's in your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning and welcome to Life Church. I'm Nick Wilson, the marketing and production ministry leader here at Life. Before we get started with our new sermon series, there are a few announcements I wanna go over real quick. Coming up on May 21st, we will be having our spring baptisms to celebrate various individuals in our congregation who have decided to make this public declaration of their next step in their walk with Jesus. 
Baptism Sunday will be at our usual service times on May 21st. If you want to get baptized and haven't signed up yet, head on over to the Life Church app and sign up there. We would love to come alongside you in this step of faith. Another thing, next Sunday, April 30th, we as a body of believers will be wearing our blue Breland shirts to help support Breland Rich in her fight against Lyme disease. To continue to show our support for this family, we are dedicating all of April 30th to Breland. If you haven't been able to buy a shirt, we will have some for sale in the cafe in the middle of the week and on Sundays as well. However, we would still love for you to participate, so if you don't have a shirt, please wear blue or green next weekend to show your support. We will be taking a picture of everyone in their blue and green to send to Breland. We will also have a donation table set up in the cafe if you simply want to send a donation. All proceeds will go directly to the Rich family. If you have any questions, please see Heather Heipel for more information. All right, thank you for joining us today. Now, let's listen in to Mike as he begins our new sermon series in Galatians. We hope you have a great Sunday. All right, good morning. Good to see everybody here at our main campus. Welcome to you guys that are joining us online. So as we get started, you just open up your uh, Bibles or your phone. We're going to go into Galatians, um, and we're going to, again, hopefully, depending how long I talk, I made it in the first uh, service through it. So we're going to try to do one chapter a week, right? So it's going to be six weeks studying uh, Galatians, and we're going to go chapter by chapter, and again, to the best of our ability, line by line, to be able to, to study the book of Galatians. Now, the thought is, why study a book, or why is it important as a church to take opportunities to study books of the Bible, or why is it for you personally important to study books of the Bible? Like, why is that relevant in our lives. So there's a couple ways to teach and to learn. So one of the ways that we learn or one of the ways that you are taught is, is that we, like the way we learn, if I have a problem, right, and I want to solve that problem, I try to find the answer to be able to solve the problem, right? So we, at times, as Christian people, we have a problem, we go to the book of the, or a place in the Bible, and we read about it with the hopes that that scripture will fix our problem. Does that make sense? Or as teachers, right, we say, here's a big issue in today's culture. I'm going to give you multiple different scriptures throughout the Bible that will help teach you about what the, the topic is or how we can solve the topic. That's one way to teach those things, right? We can teach them in that way, which is all fine, but it does create somewhat of a problem and I think has created somewhat of a problem in our lives and in the church, right? So if you don't study books of the Bible, one of the things you can easily do is go around the things that you don't like. <laughs> Nobody's ever done that, right? Like you're reading along and you're like, skip that guy, right? <laughs> or skip that chapter, go past that thing. Like this doesn't make any sense. Like I'm, I'm speaking of myself, right? Because when you read it, you're like, this doesn't make any sense to me. It isn't relevant for the day that, that we're in today. You know, I don't really want to address it. Let's go to the places in the Bible that are better, right? So we go and we look at that. And or, this is what I think the bigger problem is, we have churches that are created around teaching that makes you feel comfortable, but you're not right. Does that make more sense? Right, like... We're going to pick things that are subjects to talk about, and we're going to find scripture to support those subjects, but we're never going to talk about the hard stuff, because you know what happens when you talk about the hard stuff? It don't go very well, <laughs> right? Like, people don't want to come in, and they don't want to hear that, like, what it has to say, so churches or people have a tendency to skip over that stuff. So the reason we're going to teach a book of the Bible is so that you can't skip over stuff. We can't skip over teaching it. And so here's what you have to do when you're teaching a book of the Bible. You have to deal with what it says, right? We have to go through it. We have to deal with it. And we have to decide what and how does it fit? How is God speaking to us? And what are the things that we need to change? That's what we're going to do. Now, in the way that Paul writes inside, because that's what we're going to be focusing on, Paul wrote uh, Galatians to a group of churches that are together. So Paul, when he writes letters or teaches churches, he teaches in two different ways. One is, so when he would go in, he would plant a church, and he did this in every one of the churches. He would say, here's the truth, right? It's 
here's the truth of the gospel. Here's the truth in, like maybe in church terminology. Here's doctrine. Like these are the things that you need to believe. And he would teach it, right? And then he would come back and revisit them and see how they were doing. So one of the ways that he addressed the churches that he had went and preached the gospel to or set a doctrinal foundation is he would go to them and he would write to them like the Corinthians. This is a perfect example. So the Corinthian church understood or believed all of the right things, so they believed what Paul said. They just couldn't figure out how to live it out. Does that make sense? So they, they believed it, but then they were like, dude, we can't figure out how to take this and make it fit into real life. So Paul would say to them, better, right? Like you at least understand what to believe and you understand that the way that you're living is not right. Be thankful for grace. And they'd be like, thankful for grace. Right? Does that feel like we're not tracking? Like, when you believe what is true, but you have trouble living it out, it allows for grace in your life. It allows for you to experience the grace that only comes through Jesus Christ, right? When you're at those places. And so Paul just addresses them in the ways that he should. Hey, you need to try to figure out life, but as you're figuring out it, grace applies. Jesus loves you. Keep trying to figure it out but at least you know what's true, right? Now, the other way that he writes is he writes to churches that he also went to, and he said, hey, here's the gospel, here's the truth, here's your foundation, here's what you should believe, right? And then he comes back to them and says, you know what your problem is? You no longer believe what is true. You have taken the foundation and shifted it, and here's the key part of all of that. He says it with such urgency, right? When he writes to the Corinthian church, it's not as much urgency because you know what? You need to change, but this, this is part of working out your salvation. Anybody else been there? Like it takes time. Like you're just working it out and you're working it out, but you know what's true. You recognize you're a sinner. You need Jesus. And you just keep working it out. You go back and forth. And so he writes to him and wants him to change, but it's not like, oh my gosh, 911, wake up. When he's writing to the church in Galatia, he's saying, 911, wake up, because you know what the problem is? Here's the problem. You see, when he writes to the church in Galatia and how he's writing, you know, and what we're going to be studying, he's writing to a problem that's inside of the church, not outside of the church. You see, inside of the church, this is really important. He's not talking about people's belief systems outside of the church. He's saying, inside of the church, there's a huge problem. And this huge problem that you have inside of the church, grace is not sufficient for. You're in trouble. There is no grace for wrong beliefs. Are we tracking? Does that make sense? Because we can have right beliefs and wrong living, and that's what grace makes up. Like, we just make mistakes and we're sinners. But when you choose to manipulate and change the word of God and change the gospel to fit what you want in life, and you change the foundation, he's saying, 911, you are going to hell. You happy you're here this morning? <laughs> True? Right, like... He's saying, like, I don't want you to miss this because I, it, this is why he writes it with such a sense of urgency because here's what he sees, and I think we need to recognize this. You see, people who understand truth understand they need Jesus. People who shift doctrine no longer need Jesus. They take care of it on their own. Is that? And the problem, and see, this is what he's saying. Here's the big problem. You see, people outside of the church, this is, this is, at least this is what I think, for the people that I talk to, the people that don't believe at all, like they understand, like they have no hope of heaven. And they already know, after they die, there is no hope of heaven, right? There is nothing that's going to be after the fact. Like for a lot of them, they just believe there's nothing after the fact. You just go into the ground, you turn to dust. They don't even think of that, so they're not even dealing with that. The problem inside of the church, so they're not deceived, I guess, does that make sense? So for them, they're like, well, I know what, what they believe is true, and so they believe it. But you know what the problem is? Is that this is what God sees, and this is the problem that I think he's saying, 911, 911, inside of the church today, many people sitting in chairs, scripture would say, are going to hell, and they show up every Sunday.
right? And here's why. When false teaching comes in and perverts the gospel or perverts the message, you no longer need a savior. You just need religion. Right? When you, don't, when, you, when you bring in false doctrine or false teaching, you no longer have a need for a Savior. You no longer need rescue. You no longer need Jesus to be on the cross. Like All you need is you and your right living and you becoming a better person. Right? Like That's what happens in, in the lives of people. So that's why he's saying, listen, 911 to the, to the church now. Here's the other thing. So wh- how does that relate to us? Well, I want you to hear this. There is a 911 emergency going on in the church today for the same reason, right? False teaching and false doctrine and false beliefs has pervaded inside of the church, invaded inside of the church, has been accepted inside of the church, and deception has been accepted, and people are just going down the road and not talking about it, right? Now... I went ahead and said, okay, so what are some of those things? So Paul's going to address false teaching and how to learn about false teaching and how we can understand the truth of the gospel. But to make it make sense, you know, so I don't just say, oh, you got to believe in sound doctrine. Everybody's out there going, what's doctrine? Right? Like, what's false teaching? Like, I want to make sure that I put it in some reality of what I think is happening in the church today. And these are actually things that if you study, you will see are changes or a perversion of or a shift in what the original scripture says to what they now are teaching. And it's not weird out churches that are doing it. It's everyday evangelical churches in America teaching these messages. Like, here's one of them. Like, one of the new messages messages inside of the churches, there is no hell, right? Like God is love, there is no literal hell, right? And that if every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, surely everybody's gone, right? Like that's in, it's taught, it's, it's discussed, it's just a part of a doctrine inside of evangelical churches today, just erases hell. Now, a lot of you are out there been like, Dude, those guys are idiots. There ain't no way. Who would not believe that they're hell? Well, think about it this way. Maybe you don't either. You know why? You ever been to a funeral where somebody's up there being like, hey, we just want to let you know, thanks for everybody. Welcome to the funeral service today. That poor sucker's in hell today, but (laughs) you could change. Anybody been to one of those? Yeah, Todd and Ernie were the only two in last service, too. But you've ever seen that before? You ever see anybody get up there? Like, we got to know, based upon Scripture, not everybody's going to a better place. But every funeral you're at, everybody is going to a better place. Well, maybe this will make more sense. You know, if you believe in the reality of a real hell and what it looks like and the, you know, the, the, how bad it is and the isolation and just you know, what the reality of what hell really is and that there are people going there and actually people that you love might be going there, you would think that there would be a sense of urgency for us to do something about it, like if you really believed in hell. They just did a survey of evangelical Christian people inside of the church. Do you know the way that people get out of hell and go to heaven is to hear and respond to the gospel? Do you know how many Christians have shared the gospel with somebody they love over the past year? In the survey, less than 90% of evangelical Christian people have shared the gospel in the past year, then you must not believe in hell. Or you must not believe that anybody that you know is going there. Right? Because if you did, you would share the gospel. Right? Like, you would, but we've kind of permeated this, like, false teaching that, you know, there is no hell and that we've kind of erased this idea. The other one is this idea that there are many ways to get to, to heaven or many ways to get to God. Like, as long as you're religious and you're okay and you, you do better in your life that all of those people are somehow gonna make it. Like, this is inside of the church. Like, this is something that's talked about. And, and it's had to be, you know why it's had to be inside of the church for a lot of churches? You know, the whole tolerance movement? 
right? Like there's, you, you gotta be tolerant or you're gonna be canceled. That's what it is, right? Yeah. Canceled. Yeah, yeah like you gotta be, you gotta, to, you gotta have a tolerance that covers a broad, broad scope because if you're not tolerant, then you're not accepting. And if you're not accepting, then you're canceled and you're not relevant anymore. So pretty much what the churches have said, you know why? As long as you're trying, as long as you're working at it, Right? As long as you're going down the roads and trying to be more religious, as long as you're just not an awful person and like who defines awful? You know what I mean? Do you ever think about that? Like who really defines awful? Like all of us have our own definition of what awful really is. Well, inside of the churches, they've just said, as long as you're not a terrible, bad person, then you're not going to go to hell and, and that, that you're going to be able to go to heaven. So there's many paths. Here's the other one happening inside of the church. No longer is there a literal interpretation of the Bible. Like you're gonna open up your Bible and you're gonna read it and, and churches have made significant decisions. I want you to hear this. Large denominations have made significant decisions that scripture says one thing and they've chose to do something else and everybody's like, how did that ever happen? Well, this is why it happened, because they no longer believe in the literal interpretation of the word of God. That's how it happens, right? If it clearly says in scripture that this is the way that it should be, and you believe that the Bible is the living word of God, then you're going to do what the Bible says and not come up with an excuse or another way, unless you just don't believe that it's the literal, literal word of living word of God written to you, the way to God to speak to you. So you'll make decisions, and again, you know, big denominations have made decisions, but let's be honest. We make decisions all the time to go against what it says. And people look at you and be like, but it's okay. You'll get there in time. No, it's not okay. You know why you should not believe that it's okay? Because every time you say it's okay, you don't need grace. Right? Every time you read it and be like, well, the reason I don't, no, 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 you know, you make all, you don't need Jesus, just read it and be like, I suck, thank you for Jesus. Amen. Right? Read it that way. That's the way we should be reading it, not making excuses or saying, well, that, was, that one really wasn't literally meant to be that way. No, it literally meant you're in trouble. Thank goodness for Jesus Christ, right? And then you are always in this state of thank you, thank you, thank you, right? But if you don't believe this false teaching that comes in or false doctrine, that you no longer have to believe that what's in that is literally true and written to you. Right? False teachings enter into the church. And the other idea is this easy believism. Right? This is another thing, I don't know how else to put it, but this, this idea that you can intellectually, and I think this is happening a lot, you can intellectually believe and historically believe that Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, right? Jesus Christ came to earth, God sent him, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was nailed on a cross, intellectually believe and historically believe because you trust your friend that he actually rose from the dead and as Taylor talked about last week, sits at the right hand of the Father. You can intellectually believe those facts and still go to hell. Everybody's like, what church? Are you the false teacher? <laughs> I want you to hear this. Nowhere in scripture does it ever say that an intellectual assent to understanding facts is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Do you have to believe it? Yes. Do you have to believe in it? Yes. Does your heart need to change? Yes. Right? When your mind changes, your heart will change with it. This easy believism that you can just all of a sudden have an intellectual ascent and be at the right place, that's false teaching, but it's permeated the church, right? Because this is what we see, and you might not believe this, but look around or maybe even evaluate your own life. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to intellectually believe what they told me I needed to believe, but I'm going to go out and live my life the way I want to live it. Nobody's calling you out. 
True? Not true? Like, nobody's calling you out. Nobody's saying, hey, listen, nowhere in Scripture does it say you get to say it and intellectually believe it and then go do whatever you want. In fact, what it says in Scripture, you now surrender your life. That's what it says. Surrender your life to Jesus and his ways. And is it hard? Is it difficult? Is it like all of those things? And do we fail all of the time? Yes, but when you, when you submit to that, then again, what do you remember? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Easy believism, you're, the only thing you're thankful for Jesus for is that you don't have to go to hell someday. That is false teaching. That is not what Scripture says. That is not how he tells us that, that we should resume or be. Now, for us as a church, that's why there's a 911 call, right? So we need to understand what is the truth of the gospel and how should we respond? Well, Paul, in his writing to the Galatian churches, he talks to them about, here's what you need to do, here's some things that you need to get right, and I'm hoping by the time that we're done today that we can look at it and we can decide together, like, I'm either where I need to be or I have bought into false teaching. Right? Or I've been going down this road where, you know, I've allowed false teaching to permeate my life, whether it be through the books that you're reading or the podcasts that you're in or, you know, whatever those things are, but it's led you down a path where you are now in a place where you're believing false teaching. So if you have a Bible, Galatians 1, this is where we're going to start. So Galatians 1, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. Paul, an apostle, sent not from man nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me. To the church of Galatia, this is what he writes, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for your sins to rescue you from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever, amen. Now let's go right back to the beginning, verse one. Why does Paul have to set his authority up for the people that he's writing to? Like, why is that important? Right? Why did he say right from the beginning, listen, I am an apostle, not sent by man, but sent by God, right? Well, here's why he has to establish it, and we'll make it make sense for all of us. So remember, he went in and he planted this church and he said, you know what, I've seen Jesus. He met me on the road. I spent time with him in Arabia. This is what you need to know about the risen Savior. He laid a foundation of sound doctrine and they believed in his authority. Does that make sense, right? Like they believed what he said was true, right? So by believing what he said is true, right, then they did everything based upon that belief system, all of a sudden, another teacher comes in and says, oh, what Paul said is wrong and what I'm saying is right. And they shift from one teacher to the next teacher. And if you don't understand who has authority, you're gonna do the same thing, right? So Paul is establishing something. You're right, somebody came in and went against what I taught you. So who's right? Right, like who's right? How are you going to determine who's right? Because does this sound familiar? Right? Does this sound familiar of what's going on? Like, how are you going to determine who's right? Well, Paul's saying, listen, one of the things that I can guarantee you that nobody that came into this church did, they didn't talk to God. Nobody in this church that, that came in and talked to you had three years with Jesus Christ in Arabia to be able to teach. Like, I can tell you that. Right, so Paul's establishing authority so that they could say, okay, if we're trying to decide what is true, we can base truth based upon Paul who talked to Jesus. Does that make sense? Now, why is that important for us? Who's your authority? Like, where do you get, how do you determine who's right and wrong? Like, how do you know that the person that you're listening to or the person that you're reading about or the per podcast that you're involved, how do you know that that guy's right? How do you know that I'm right? How do you know that I'm not a false teacher, right? The authority, and I'll tell you this forever and ever and ever, you should never, 
never believe the authority of a preacher over the authority of Scripture. Never. The authority of Scripture is the authority for a reason. If you want to know what's right and wrong, look at what Scripture says. Like, we can encourage you in what we're saying. Like, you should read these things, but at the end of the day, your authority of who determines what's right and wrong in your life is your Bible. You know why people, we're going to get to this in a little bit, but you know why people are so easily strayed? I don't know if anybody's reading the Bible. I think way too many people are listening to charismatic preachers and books that get them all excited and podcasts that get them all jacked up. And they're like, dude, that guy's got to be right. Because you know why? You know why he's got to be right? He's got thousands of people following him. whoop de crap You know where they're all going? It's the same place he is. If he's a false teacher. True? Like he's going, they're going to the same worldly understanding of false teachers like that, that we'll, we'll get into that in here in a second, but you can't do that, right? So our authority, so I want you to hear this, there, there's going to be a lot of worldviews and a lot of things that people think, but you have to understand authority comes from scripture. If it is the living word of God, then it has to be our authority. It has to be, if you read it and it says it, don't try to change it because it's what false teachers do. They try to add to or take away. And you know why they add to or take away? Because they don't like what it says, right? Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Just take it for what it is and recognize that you're falling short like the rest of us, right? Like you're just the same place all of us are. I'm falling short of the glory of God. Thank you for Jesus Christ and his blood who covers me and makes me right when I stand in front of Jesus. And let's come back to that all the time, right? So that's the understanding gives us from the beginning. Authority and understanding this. I have the authority. You know, I want to tell you something. You know what? Why I'm coming back and you know why this is so important to you? You know what he says in that, that, that uh, Jesus says to him? He says, listen, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for the sins to do what? Rescue you. That's why he came. You know why Jesus Christ died on a cross and bled and was beaten beyond human recognition? Because he wants to rescue you. That's the message. The message of the gospel is you need rescue. That's the message. You need rescue. And I want you to hear this. You know, part of the problem and we'll keep talking about this, but part of the problem today that people who have given in to false teaching, part of the reason they give in to false teaching is they don't think they need rescue. Right? Because it just, they, you know, you ever hear the story of like, well, I grew up in a church and I don't really have a story, you know, and I grew up in a church and I don't, you know, uh, I don't really have the, like, I was in addiction and I was rescued from addiction and now I'm saved right? And I'm saying, listen, the person who was in addiction or the person that grew up in church their entire life needed the same rescue. Anybody? Right? Doesn't matter where you grew up. Didn't matter how many times you went to church. Didn't matter how many things you had memorized in your life. We both need the same rescue. And we both need Jesus to rescue us. That's the message of the gospel. Then he goes on and he says this in verse uh, 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we were an angel from heaven, but, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And we have... Uh, and as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you had accepted, let them be under God's curse. So he says this first thing, he addresses this idea of false teachers. Like people who are teaching falsely are going to be under what? A curse, right? Not like, hey, can you try to be a better teacher? Can you try to get it right? Can you work on your message? Can you make your message a little bit more presentable? You're like, listen, if you add to and or take away, you're under a curse, right? 
add to or take away, you're under a curse, right? And he tells us, like, we as Christians should be able to, or we inside of the church should be able to identify false prophets, false teachers, right? Like, we should, but you know what he says, but the problem is so many of you were easily persuaded, So many of you were easily moved away from the original message. How does that happen? Right? Well, part of the problem is is we don't measure the level of a teacher by the truth that he speaks, but how good he speaks it. Does that make sense? Right? Like, Like, if somebody can come in and they can charismatically tell you a lie, you like that way better than a bad speaker that tells you the truth. Right, And we are easily, like, we look at these people that we see as successful, that have churches of a 1,000 people, and we think, they could never be a false teacher. Like, how could all of these people be led astray? You know, how could he have such a gift to be able to speak and be saying something wrong? Like, it happens. The worldly way of judging whether or not your teacher is good or not is a bad idea. Just because he can preach a message and just because he's a charismatic speaker, just because he can keep your attention, just because he can attract a crowd of people does not mean that he is not a false teacher. We have to understand then why is it that we can be so easily pulled away? Why is it that when we're given truth, somebody else could come in and be like, oh, that was truth for today, but this is truth for tomorrow. And then this is truth, and you kind of go wherever, you know, people move you. Why is that? Well, Paul addresses that. Listen to what he says in verse 10. And am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of God. Christ. Here's the thing. He's saying, like, listen, here's the thing that you'll know about people pleasing. If you as a teacher are a people pleaser, it will lead to false teaching. Because we're going to see this here in a second. What the gospel is inside of scripture is not very pleasing. When you teach what's in this Bible, there are a lot of people walking away like, geez, that's harsh, right? Like there are a lot of people that are looking at what it says. And if you're a people pleaser, right? Like if you're a teacher that, that, that teaches so that every, the masses can walk away be going like, so good, I feel so good. You're in trouble, you're in trouble. But if you're teaching so the masses like you, right, you're in trouble, right? This idea, Paul's like, I have to get to this place where I settle something in my life. Am I here to please you or am I here to please God? Teachers have to settle that. You know what you have to settle? Are you here to be a follower of Christ or be comfortable? Because you know how you'll be easily led astray? Because you're here today trying to find a way to be more comfortable in life, not how to follow Jesus. And you're easily led astray when somebody comes up here and like, let me tell you a better way. Like a better way, I can't wait for a better way. This way sucks, right? Give me something different. Make my life easier. Fix my marriage. Give me some money. Make my business prosperous. Make this person not sick. Make this person better. Like, what, like make something good. And somebody's like, I got something good for you. Like, thank you, Jesus. It's an answer to prayer or not. Might not be right? It might be false in the way that they're leading you down that road. And so he's saying you can't be, you got to be able to be in it to be able to, to, to only please God. Now, Jesus addresses this. And so stay in Galatians, but I'm going to go to Matthew 7 and you can go back and look at this. So in Matthew 7, Jesus deals with this issue where we have got to understand why we get to these places of being able to, to go astray and what it looks like you know, in this teaching of why we would uh, not stick to it. But here's what he says in Matthew 7, starting in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many people enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, 
and only a few find it. You see, here's the problem. Here's what it says. Let's, let's just be real for a second. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. How many people are on it? How many? A few. Is that sobering? That should be sobering to you. That out of everything that he could say inside of Scripture, pretty sobering that he would say to those of us inside of the church, this is who he's talking about. Narrow is this road that leads to life and very few of you are going to find it. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. How many people are on it? Plenty. Now listen to me. You know why narrow is the road? You know why narrow is the gate and narrow is the road? And you know why few people find it? Because here's what he tells you. There is only one way to get this right, and you can't negotiate with me any other way. You see, you know what we do today as Christian people? We try to negotiate our way. He says, you know what? There's only one way. You know what the one way is? My way. Jesus says, you want to be a follower of mine? It's my way. And you're like, well, I know it's your way, but you know, at this time in my life, you remember all the stories, right, of people who tried to negotiate with Jesus? You know any of those stories? People who came to him and said, but I have to do this, but I have to do this, and when this gets, and I get this, and I get older, and I get this right, and he's like, you're out. If you want to be a disciple of mine, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Well, pick up your cross daily, I mean, daily? No, yes, daily. You don't get to negotiate. You don't get to get your way. You live in a world where you try to negotiate your way all the way through. You don't get your way with Jesus. This is the only way, and you don't get to negotiate your way in. There's only one way. You know, this whole thing we were talking about earlier, part of the problem is, is we try to negotiate and why we're not followers, but we think we're okay. So you think you're okay in the middle of negotiations. You're not okay. You realize you don't negotiate with the God of the universe. But you don't get to negotiate your way into heaven. You don't get to change the rules. The rules are there is one way, right? That's what it says, one way. If you want to be made right with the God... If you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, he tells you very clearly, this is what you need to do. And it's more than intellectual assent to him dying on a cross and raising again. There's tons of things that says, put your hand to the plow and never look back, right? Pick up your cross daily and follow me, right? That our life should be a continual transformation of being more like him. And we want to sit around and be like, well, you know why mine's not, right? Or you know why I don't read my Bible? Or you know why I don't follow you? Or know why I don't do you? Like, don't we always do this? You know, God, why I don't. Nobody else did this, right? Like, you're negotiating the reason why you're not following him, and you're thinking he's up there saying, it's okay. Like, it's okay. When you get around to it, when you, when you get to the place, because I love negotiating with you. I love changing the rules for you. I love making your life comfortable. That's crap. He's not sitting up there saying, thanks for the negotiation. He's like, get it right, get it right, understand grace, get it right, follow me, do everything that you can. You're going to make mistakes, but stop negotiating why you don't. Stop coming up with the excuses of why you're not a follower. When my kids get raised someday, when I'm done with this job, when I'm not working so many hours, when I have more and when I understand more and when I get older and when I do, there are no negotiations. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. And if you continue to negotiate with God, wide is the road that leads to destruction, and I know you don't want to hear this, but you're on it. You're on it. If you're choosing to, to negotiate with God of why you're not a follower, it's a time for you to wake up and say, listen, you can't negotiate those things. You need to just understand that the reason it's so narrow is not because it's hard, because few people will choose to say, Amen. 
Few people are going to choose to say, you know what, because I want you to, I want you to hear this so you're not getting a, a false like leading away from this. I want you to understand, we are not capable of being followers of Jesus Christ, right? So when you're sitting there thinking, I don't know, I'll never get it right, that's, that's the idea. You get that, right? Like, that's the idea. You're never going to get it right. But when you understand narrow is the road and few people find it, doesn't mean you can't find it. Doesn't mean you're always going to have it right. Doesn't mean you're going to have it right living all the time. It's just going to be you recognizing what everybody else has missed. The only way through the narrow gate is through Jesus. And I'm going to keep following him. And I'm going to keep going and I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to keep falling away. But at the end of the day, that's where I'm going. And that's who I'm following. And that's the message for each one of us. The false doctrine says, hey, you know what? When you get it right someday and you have time. So keep your fire insurance until you get it right. There ain't no fire insurance. If you've accepted Jesus for fire insurance and you're thinking about following him later, why does the road that leads to destruction and many people are on it and it might be you? Good? Right? So then he goes on and he says, uh, how do we understand false teachers? So verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So it says two things. You want to know how to recognize a, a false teacher? By their fruit. And understand, not by the worldly standard. Remember when we talked about this, like by the worldly standard, we're saying, oh my gosh, this guy's got to be good because of the number of people that he has and how good a speaker he is. That's not good fruit. Good fruit is not being a good speaker or attracting a crowd. Good fruit, like I want, I want to hear you say that, or hear me say this. Here's what good fruit is. In scripture, good fruit means this. By the way that you live your life, you bring glory to God and people to him. That's good fruit. Does that make sense? If good fruit means, without saying a word, the way that you live your life brings glory to God. People can look at you and be like, brings glory to God. Not only will your life bring glory to God, it will bring people to him. That's good fruit. Right living, religious practices, that's not good fruit. Good fruit. Because you know there are lots of people who are going to hell who are very religious. My, maybe I said it wrong. People who will go through practices without ever having a relationship. Is that better? Right? You'll just go through the motions because you never have a relationship. So the understanding that good fruit is because of the way you live your life, you're going to bring glory to God. And because you bring people to him, that's good fruit. Now, listen. Go back. What does it say to a person who bears no fruit? Well, someday your tree will bear fruit. Is that what it says? Does it, does it say anywhere in Scripture, someday when you get around to fertilizing it, and someday when you get around to watering it, and someday when you get around to taking care of it, and someday when you get around to thinking about it, your tree is going to bear fruit? Is that what it says? What's it say about a tree that bears no fruit? And throw it in the fire. So if you're sitting there saying, well, back to negotiating, well, my life right now bears no fruit because it's negotiation. You're telling me that the way you live your life today, you can't bring glory to God. What in the world could be going on in your life that you can't bring glory to God? What in the world in our lives today, understanding the urgency that's going on, can't bring people to him? Right? You can't negotiate why your life right now has no fruit. If your tree has no fruit, then it's going to get cut down and thrown in the fire. And we need to recognize those things, and we need to understand them and not try to excuse it away. All right, back to Galatians. 
Here's what he says, and I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelations from Jesus Christ. For you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me, by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response, this is interesting, my immediate response to meeting Jesus was not to consult any human being. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Just real quick, a quick history of what happened to Paul. Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had somebody come and share the gospel with him. He was saved. Scales fell off his eyes. Immediately, he went to Arabia for three years and was taught by Jesus. Right? Taught by Jesus. Now, it's significantly important for back then because when he comes out and says, it's like, nobody's corrupted my teaching. Like, this didn't come from anybody else. No human have corrupted the message that I'm bringing you. The message I'm bringing you is Jesus said, I'm telling you. Jesus said, I'm telling you. Time and other people and other influence haven't corrupted the message. This is what the true message of it is. So he's saying to you, like, listen, I didn't consult, consult human beings. I consulted God, and then I came and told you what he said. Really important. Now, how does that apply to us today? Here's why I was showing you this before. I want to say it to you again. Preachers can give you ideas. Preachers can help you work through some things. People can, preachers can help you, you know, uh, go down some certain roads. Books, podcasts, all those things can help enlighten you. But nothing is going to change you like your relationship with Jesus Christ and talking to him. You know why? You see, and I want to, I want to make sure you understand this. No preacher at any church can look at you and say, I know you, I know how create, I created you, I know the plan that I have for you, and I want to tell you how to act it out. Nobody can. No preacher can do that. Only Jesus Christ, who knew you from the beginning of time, can talk to you directly and say, you want to consult somebody on getting life right? Talk to the one who made you. Talk to the one who has a plan for you. Talk to the one that's going to give you the power to change the world. Preachers can stir up some things, but life change happens because then you immediately go to the one who's going to change you. Amen. Jesus, right? Like, that's where we got to go, because he's the only one who knows what you really need. Don't just leave here and be like, boy, that's a good word, that's a good word, that you will forget Monday, just the way that it works. A good word moves you into conversations with a good Savior, right? That, that's the way that it works. Now, the worship team's going to come back up. I want to give you this last part that he tells us, you know, in verse 18. He says, then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, obviously Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you that before God, that what I'm telling you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and to Sicily, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who is formerly persecuted is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy, and they are praising God among, they are praising God because of me. Now, let's end it with this. Paul, specifically, back to what we talked about in the beginning, saying, 911 emergency to the churches in Galatia. You guys have a serious problem, and if you don't turn around the problem, right, there are no second chances, right? If you don't turn around the problem, you guys are going down a slippery slope and you're going to be in a place where again, we can always return to the gospel, but you're gonna be in a place where if things happen and, you're, and you fall away or you die, you're gonna be in the wrong place. Like, it's a 911 emergency. Right? And you need to change it. You need to recognize that they are, they are false teachers. You need to recognize what the false teaching is. And more than anything, you need to change. You need to repent, and you need to turn back to what is true. That's what he tells them. You need to repent, and you need to turn back to what is true. 
And I just want to say, listen, as much as I read in Galatians and study Galatians and how urgent Paul was to say to the church, like, you need to change, I want that same urgency for us today. Because the church is under attack from the inside. You see, we always used to always believe that the church is attacked from the outside for those people who don't believe and those people who are here to destroy the church. Listen, I want to tell you something. They can't destroy the church. The church gets destroyed from the inside out through deception, through wrong beliefs, through going down roads that, that you think that you're okay and pretty soon you find yourself on the wide road. That's how it happens. Keep a bunch of people comfortable and happy, right? Keep them in a place where they're never like confronted with anything and then they go down the road and pretty soon you see a bunch of people gathering but no power in the gospel. You see, here's what I want you to understand that Paul was trying to say and I want us to say today. If you want power for revival, if you want power to change the word, the power is in the gospel. That's where the power is. The power, and you know why the power is in the gospel? Because listen, we're getting ready to take communion, right? And when you take communion, this is something that we're all supposed to remember, right? So when we come up and we have the blood and and the bread and the the wine or, or the grape juices to make us remember like, I'm so thankful right, that you rescued me, right, that's what, that's what it's supposed to be, and see, for all of us, like, if you want power in the gospel, this is the power, Lord, I am so thankful that not only did you rescue me, but you rescue me every single day, that's power, The power in the gospel is is that it continues, that every day that we wake up and we try to follow him, that we remember like we fall short and I'm just thankful for your grace and I'm thankful for your mercy. You know why there's no power in the gospel for people who didn't think they need rescued? Right, there's no power in that gospel. Like there's no power in the message that we're not getting what we deserve. Like the gospel message is you deserved hell, but you're not going to get it. Not by anything that you did. Not by any of your religious activity, but what Jesus Christ did for you. You can be saved. You can be empowered. You can change the world. The power is through the blood of Jesus. And the power is through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. We should be thank you for, thankful for the rescue. And so we're going to take some time here to... Uh, just to sit and think and process. And here's what I want you to think about. Two things. So maybe today, for the first time, I, you have come to a place where you're like, you know what, I need rescue. Like, I didn't know it, but I need rescue. Like, I've been living in this life, and this hasn't been good, and I need rescued. And I just want to give you the opportunity that while we're doing this time together, if you want to come up, we'll pray for you, pray with you, and take communion with you, and celebrate with the angels in heaven that you can be rescued today, right? Like, if you want that in your life, come up, we'll pray for you, pray with you, and take communion with you together. For you or for us who have been there and we've understood the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, can you just take a moment to say thank you? Before you come out, can you meditate on the thankfulness for his grace and his mercy? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we're thankful for the blessings that you've given us. We're so thankful for the true gospel message. Lord, And we just pray that as we take communion together, Lord, that you will remind us that that you did rescue each one of us. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. So let's take a time of reflection and then Corinne will open the communion.